Performance and Economic Development. It is Thursday, February 29th, 2024 at uh, 10.08 in the morning. And now we're back uh, to continue our discussions on the FY25 budget, continuing to work with our legislative council, Rick Sagel. So good morning, Rick. Thank you good morning. for joining us. Okay, so since Rick Sagel led us to the council, since the last time we were here, um, I worked on the, the MTAP language. Do you mind if we start there, or do you want to? And I have these final budget requests we need to go over. So I have questions for the committee because um, the language in, uh, I believe it's Act 3, that was passed last year, that um, sets out the MTAP or the MTA program. The language that was suggested, this is just copy and pasted. I didn't actually edit this at all, but it, number one, is it in the right place? And number two, uh, I think we need to work on this proposed language a little bit because it's not exactly clear and it's not written, um, I think, to be clear. So, and I have the act pulled up. If you want to look at the rest of the act, section 95 here. And my understanding is this language would allow more municipalities to access the funding, correct? And this language would appear to be a category that they want municipalities to be able to tap into if they have a project that is capital in nature or an activity that is a precursor or requirement to taking on a capital project. I just think we need to kind of firm that up a little bit. And, and by the way, it's already in the statute, sub subdivision F there. Um, that's already in the statute or in session law. I am smiling. Yeah. So they have a way to approve. If it's not A, B, C, D, E, they could still um, <clears throat> approve it. But this might make it more helpful. I'm wondering if they're not thinking okay. that you know, some of these municipal projects may not provide economic development. Yeah, I'm not approved by the by you know, it might be yeah. okay. viewed as a hurdle to okay. some. That's the testimony that we got. Yeah. yeah. I was just gonna clarify my entire brain. E is the new language. Yeah. Yes. Okay. F is the current E. Right. F is the current age. And again, I think this is the right place, but this section is longer. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that's the, and the intent is not to, and just, you know, again, the intent is not to expand any municipalities that are eligible, are not currently eligible. This is just to allow municipalities that are already eligible to do a different kind of project. So a precursor requirement to taking on a capital project would encompass a needs assessment, a planning study. That, that is a very broad, painting with a very broad brush. And it may be the case that not some of those activities herein defined aren't funded through a set amount of state or federal funding specific. There might not be money state or federal money that, that could fund those specific right. activities that are therein defined in need. Does that make sense? Likely it is, they are, yeah. but I can't, sure there would be an instance where they would not be. There are projects that yeah, cause may be eligible for funding on this that wouldn't otherwise be eligible for the monies that we're hoping to pull down with these monies. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like needs assessments, it's hard to find money for needs assessments or, yeah, for major capital projects, yeah. state or federal. Yeah, in general, it's hard to find 
scope and deployment dollars. Exactly. Without having a list of all of the available state and federal opportunities, if only they were on a website. Uh, we don't, <laughs> we don't, I'm sorry. We don't, we can't know, right? We can't yeah. know. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's kind of the hard part is to, to try to draw a box, a more narrow box. Can I ask what would be an example of an activity that would be a precursor or requirement to take it on? Like what would be an example of that? As, as Logan said, a, a, a scoping study, a needs assessment, um, community uh, planning, resilience planning, which like facilitating conversations in a neighborhood about major projects, blood remediation or otherwise. So could a precursor be an email asking about, like, is this, I'm just saying like, of course you, before you take on a capital project, you want to do your due diligence and that could just be a phone call, an email, and that would be a precursor. Yeah. To, so uh, requirement is very specific. Uh, precursor is not very specific. Yeah. So we want to maybe discuss that or figure out a different way of wording that. I don't know why they felt they needed this because it's, I mean, this just the A, B, C, D, E or not the, the original. But that's just an inclusion, but it doesn't, yeah, you know, negate anything else. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Right. right. Well, I mean, I think the best oh, part that we had gotten was that they to some extent, you know, this money came from the, or the, the language came from the RPCs, and they felt that at times AOA was more restrictive with what projects fit into MTAP than was maybe necessary. And so they're, I think they're giving us this language was to try to broaden it and not leave as much discretion to AOA. You're saying they were enforcing these categories to the exclusion of stuff that's not on the list? I don't know that I would say that, but I think that, like, I think that with, you know, the current E, but, you know, now in this language F, you know, it was kind of presumed that that would be a little more open-ended and just kind of allow anything that might otherwise be eligible for ARPA or FEMA, you know, other, any other grants that are out there that we're just trying to pull down and, I think what we've heard from the RPCs is that AOA has been a little more restrictive with that language than they necessarily need to be, yeah. and has been not using MTAP to the extent that the RPCs would like. And so I think there is, you know, there is, a, you know, really a policy decision here about whether you want to. You know, AOA did not ask for this language. I don't know if AOA would be supportive of it. This language is from the RPCs who maybe aren't sure if AOA, you know, the way that AOA has been interpreting the existing language. I thought AOA wanted to see results, I think they've, they've talked about it. I haven't asked them directly, I guess. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen, they, they said that they were supportive of the idea of problem. I don't know if they're supportive of it being exactly where it is and what it changed. Doug signed off on it, right? Doug he signed off on the idea. Longer. I don't think that any, I'm just saying, yeah. I don't think Doug has seen it in the statute yeah. where it was going to go. Um, and so I don't, yeah, I wouldn't get ahead of presuming that they're okay with this as presented. I, if I can, if we can be in a conversational mode, I, I don't think this is actually encompassing of all eligible ARPA projects because ARPA money can now be used for disaster remediation and recovery. And while most of that those projects are capital in nature or concerning climate change, I would say not all of them are. And because it's not just disaster remediation, it's also economic, addressing economic impacts. So like uh, micro grants to businesses or whatever. That's that's not a capital project, but it is disaster recovery. So I don't think even, I mean, if we want to, I'd say E broadens it 
certainly, but it's not all encompassing of all eligible ARPA money uses. No, well, only, only to the extent for municipalities. Sure. But but a municipality can issue micro grants to they can have yeah, but they this, do yeah but the, the the purpose of this is to have the R, RPCs work with the municipality to develop to go out and, and get the grants okay it's it's not we're not granting we're not asking them to use this do, these dollars to grant out to municipalities or or others to help them with mit, with mitigation this is to Mm -hmm. at the planning stage to help them work with especially the small municipalities that don't have planners that yeah and that, that's what so I, I think we're grabbing that okay of you know what the what the municipalities can go out and look for as far as their as far as what those communities needs are And yeah, no, no. but also uh, VLCT and other who else has been working with MCAT? I mean, it's not just I've been saying just yeah. RBCs, but um, the MCAT program has encompassed VLCT and um, is it preservation trust. The uh, maybe, um, no, just to say that there have been other organizations, I think yeah. private as well, maybe <clears throat> that have been uh, contracting with. Um, Pay away to you know offer this technical assistance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good with this. I don't think it. I, I don't think it hurts. I, yeah, yeah. I think I take Jonathan's point to heart. Just that there are. I think the original intent of this for me was the idea that there is a lot of money out there that towns, especially small towns, don't have the ability to to yeah. access and yeah. get and. You know, this still doesn't necessarily help get all of the money that's remaining. Um, but I think this does, you know, this is what the RPCs wanted. They're the boots on the ground. Yeah, I think I would trust them as long as, yeah, just double check with AOA to make sure that they're okay with this in the location. So have generally broadly signed off on the idea of this language. Yeah, I think it, it couldn't hurt. Rick, can you send that on to Doug Fine and just make sure they're okay with where this is at? <clears throat> I know this is the original session law there under F, but um, I'm trying to I'm trying to recall why, and maybe I'm reading this incorrectly, but is the approval by the AOA only in relevant um, relation to the community economic development projects in F, or is that to all the other items? I think it encompasses the whole thing. everything that comes before it and other, maybe not. Rick, is that how you would interpret that? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, it's an F, and yes. I know this is already what the session law. Because it is an language. Language. Not an Yeah. So I'm just trying to read this. So is Anne approved by the AOA? Um, is that applied to A through? So no, F? that would just be F. just F. Just F. Yeah, so A, B, C, D, and if E is approved, uh, those would not need agency approval. Okay. I don't remember why we pulled out just the economic. Um, I think because it was the idea that versus it, you know, versus the, any of those other. It could be ARPA. You know, some of these were federal dollars, and mm -hmm. so you we wanted the we wanted AOA to kind of have some ability to to make exceptions or approvals based on what they thought might be eligible within those categories. I mean, I think at the time, this some of this list was the things that was like current ARPA guidance. Since then, ARPA guidance has changed, you know, four times. Right. So the original A through, well, at least A through D, um, because there were ARPA guidelines sort of really defining what could be used, what could not be used, AOA's oversight was not necessary, but, but new F, which was formerly E, was outside of. I think I'm just, again, little, I'm just trying to it's a little open ended, and okay. so there are there. I think the idea was that there were things within economic development, mm -hmm. community economic development projects that may or may not be eligible, and so AOA was just put. Yeah, this fits within the okay. Okay. I think yeah. you know this is right. a year ago, so that could be. But yeah. that's yeah. the way I'm remembering. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, because AOA Doug Farnham has is the go to yep. of yep. of all the regulate all the regs. Yep. So if there's other he knows are within the regs already, I think. And if there's other economic development projects that the municipality identifies, the whoever is helping them needs to go back to AOE and make sure that those are eligible projects right. under the regs. So with E, the new language in E, does that need a similar caveat or a approval by AOA or is also remember, you know, at the very top here, yeah. it's the AOA that is designing and implementing this process. Um, so they're 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 overseeing all this anyway. So do they need to approve uh, A B C D? I mean, they already kind of are creating that process inherently. Mm -hmm. I think F F is just designed to be a catch-all, specific to economic development Sorry. project. I'm sure that answers your question, but I'm not going to die so I just was just curious about why, yeah. you know, if we needed to be, if we're adding this kind of new category that isn't specifically coming out of the federal regulations from these other, you know, the Infrastructure Act, et cetera, do we just need to tie the two together? So that's clear, but I also think the beginning, the AOA is standing this up or continuing yeah. to stand or continuing to keep it up. <laughs> Sorry, stood up. Okay. So I think in general, we support changing that language that we're getting from everyone. So we'll wait to hear from Doug, make sure that that's in the right place and, okay. And just to finish this part up here, uh, let me know, this is how I have it worded. D100, A3B. I want to make sure that it's not not the municipalities the ability for them to access the MCAT funds, it's the ability to access all federal and state the all of the available state and or federal and state funds. Yeah, I wonder if you could almost say something like in order for communities <clears throat> to be able to fulfill the original intent of the program. Yeah. Yeah. It would yeah. We believe the um, uh, yes, thank you. I was almost there, Logan. Yeah, no, I was even. Interesting. Okay, what do you all think about that? Yeah, there it's good. So the cat is again. And bolding the recommendations. Yeah, with the. Okay. Can you just go back to the language one last time? Sorry. No, no problem. So, okay. I was just looking at the, the language, the ARPA language, and it's acquisition of real property for public purpose or construction, reconstruction, rehabilitation of public facilities improvements. So, I just want to make sure that. We're as broad as the, <clears throat> so we don't, 
Yeah, a municipal but property know, those, capital could be purchasing. Yeah. You know, for the municipality. Or it could be <clears throat> construction rehabilitation. I think we're good. Okay. Thank then, you. sure. And these are the last, based on my notes, the last five that we need to go through the Better Places UVM Green Mountain Jobs Retention Program, the Humanitarian uh, Parolees, New Refugees, Transitional Housing, and the VSO, which the I have a note the committee recommends, but I'm not sure any more detail than that. I also, I mean, we just heard from uh, adult uh, this morning. Yeah. Adult that too. And you recommend there? Well, told not as much of a request there as I thought I could. Yeah. And the request over the governor's recommend is struggle to say only $600,000. Only $600,000. Oh, before I forget, if you don't mind, committee, uh, I spoke to JFO about the uh, where is it? Full time employee. Oh, so the CVO EO. Yes. Um, the committee recommended that the they request the ten percent salary increase and that new position, yeah. um, and the committee recommended that the salary increase be tied with the governor's recommended pay act increase. Mm -hmm. And that new employee should also have their salary matched to that uh, pay increase. So JFO, um, they were given a number that the governor suggested for the amount of money to increase, but not a percentage. And um, they said that's not really public yet. And the percentage would be difficult to calculate. So what I decided was, well, why don't we just say the increase should instead be matched to the final pay act salary increase rate in the fiscal year 25 budget. And I believe you all throughout the 3%, it's probably gonna be around there, but we just don't have that final number yet. Yep. Yeah. Okay, but yep. Yeah, I think that makes the intent. I mean, this is up, so just go yeah. over ropes. This makes the intent clear to them. Okay. Yeah. And also we recommend that the new FT salary reflect the 24 budget salary plus the final pay act salary increase rate in the 25 budget. Okay. Okay, okay. now, better places or wherever you wanna start. That's a good place to stay. We've talked about better places. We wanna recommend the amount. What was the, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not excited. I'm not, I, now looking at the bigger picture, I'm, I'm, I think it's not something that um, rises to the top of my priority list. But, but unfortunately, it's a good and strong program, and compared to other things, I would not put it in our um, budget recommend letter. I would not put it in our budget <laughs> I don't know. The, the only unknown for me here is just that there is a new line item in the budget. The, the budget notes that are on the side. The language is exactly the same from better places and this new line item. But this new line item is called strengthening communities and downtowns. And it's for 600,000. And so I think my I have that remaining question of just like, what is that program? Where is that money going? Is it a similarly designed? Is so overseeing it? I think I, the new program. Is it new? Is it it's it's new in the budget? It's not. New grant supports public spaces improvements and programming similar goals to better places. So those, those are my notes, obviously, but that's so where is the language? I couldn't find any. Um, is there a bill some in another committee that <clears throat> in other parts of the budget that you know like with our 708 mm -hmm. um you know it said in the notes that it was tied to a you know a specific bill 
Uh, and so in this one, this one, I just didn't, I was never able to run down exactly where that money is intended to go or what program it's intended to support. To me, it's, you know, it seems like an interesting year to unfund a program that's otherwise been used and to fund a new pilot. Yeah, but you got to have language. You need policy to go around the program. Yeah, yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe it does exist and I just didn't, you know. I want to check with Chris. It's on not that. our corner. I, th I would say that's a, a remaining question for me is just yeah. whether there's room there to support an existing program. So just, um, what's the name of that new one that they're talking about? Strengthening Communities in Downtowns. I want to put that in there, Strengthening Communities in Downtowns. Is that within ACCD or do you not even know where it is? It's within, oh, it's within the, the DHCD budget. Okay. Development. It's sitting in Tom's committee. It's within their grant sale. Oh, it's literally right behind the department in the spreadsheet. <laughs> the next row. Yeah, sorry. Hmm. Yeah, it's on one of the grants out sheets. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. Maybe in our. If we do something about. I think we did do something strengthening community. Use it was during COVID trying to get people trying to get things set up outside grants for <clears throat> municipalities and mm. that were downtown so that they could take up the spot on sidewalks so that cafes could or restaurants could get people outside getting back to being able to get back into business without having and people couldn't cluster inside. Yeah. I find it odd that they would have come in here and asked for funding for better places. They didn't. I'm sorry. That they were supportive of, other entities were supportive of that program being funded back up to full, okay. but they never mentioned this at all. Yeah, I mean, obviously part of that is, you know, my fault just, you know, when I put this spreadsheet together, it was like, you know, a couple of days after we had them in. Um, so you know. I think we can do one of two things. We can, can put it in our budget letter and attach a fund to it, an amount up to, and then we can, because I want to go back after we get this done and rate everything. Mm -hmm. So it could be rated you know, high, medium, low, or we can keep it out. So it's like a relatively even split, which makes it seem like it's not a high priority in general. I, I personally, I have you know, liked the program. Well, Lowe's pulled down some money from it. Yeah, you know, I've seen some value in it. I do. Yeah, you know, I take Jonathan's. Um, issues with it. I think, you know, he has really valid concerns just about, you know, the nature of uh, crowdsourcing and how you know, the slippery slope, I don't generally like slippery slope arguments too much because I feel like people sitting in these chairs are going to have to make a decision if it changes to that, that extent, but I do um, also appreciate your concerns and I really uh, yeah, I see where you're coming from for sure. So I guess I would say that I, yeah, while I support the program, I, I think it does come on, come in pretty low on my list compared to all the other pressures and programs <clears throat> that I want to see that we are recommending. Others? It's not on my list anymore. I love the idea of the program. I think we need a nonprofit funding it. Yeah, I mean, you all know I'm a, I'm a fan of it. Um, 
I do feel like I do feel like you know small communities don't have access to or a skill set. You know, for all the same reasons why we uh, are doing the MCAP or or the to support the, the municipalities is because they don't have the resources to do do these kind of programs. And so, you know, they don't have these resources to, to do any kind of community revitalization either. And so this is a way that where we are teaching them, giving them the skills, the ability and teaching community groups within that community, not necessarily the municipality, how to, how to get their needs met. And, and so I feel like it's, it's you know, it serves exactly that kind of community that MTAP is trying to serve in a different capacity. And so I, I feel like it's actually a, a, should be a big priority to small communities, uh, you know, communities under 2000. So. I'm also a fan, but it's like, I understand budget constraints and people's concerns. Um, yeah, I, I guess I echo everything Kirk just said. Um, and I guess mm, I understand if we can't figure out this year with budget concerns, but would love that we like take, that we do continue to think through opportunities if we're not going to fund it for uh, community members to be able to source grant funding without having to go to um, three municipalities. Or, I mean, what's really going to happen is they're not going to be able to go to three municipalities in many places because um, there's not capacity and they will come to nonprofits and nonprofits will need to fiscally sponsor more projects, which, yeah. <laughs> well, and originally when this program was set up, it was just that fact that, you know, that these small nonprofits that were, or small community groups within municipal and the small municipalities don't know where to go. And I think we heard from, this is before I think a lot of you were here, but we heard from a lot of the bigger nonprofits that, that fund these projects would rather see it in one, one space instead of, yeah. And that way they can, then they, they actually do follow up into helping these support these um, with, with funds through the crowdfunding source. So um, it's easier for those nonprofits not having to look at all these applications. They can see what's going on and, and decide whether they want to fund these different projects. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I, you all know how I feel about this. I, I, I'm not supportive. Uh, I believe you can absolutely have a program like this that does not ask for money from individuals. You can have a state program that funds art with community, that develops community buy-in without asking individuals, individuals on fixed incomes, older adults, vulnerable populations for money out of their pockets. I don't believe that is a legitimate way to, to do this. As speaking as someone who was a former Municipal official and town administrator, I find it challenging. That's all. It's Can I ask a question? To and just hypothetically, if you were supportive of this but not crowdfunding, would you support a grant program with a match? And it didn't matter where the match came from, but that people had to come up with match. People or the or the municipality. So say like instead of the better put like so I have a mural I want to do and normally in better places I would apply and then I'd have to come up with what two is it a third match? I think yeah. So would you be supportive of yet another like grant program but one that does not have to go through people don't have to go through municipalities. They might go through like nonprofit or something that's still state funded that then a third of like the match has to be people have to come up with a third if, if you scaled the match to the resources of the community potentially but there are, are inequities in asking communities for matching funds as well any any town administrator of a small world town which will tell you that sure all of our state funds have matches right now right no, not all <laughs> most like mm -hmm. a very large percentage of <laughs> 
mean, for me, it's we're what, 15 million in the hole and we're looking at another program that is not necessary for government right now. And I get that it's a great program and I get that we need more community art and more community playgrounds and more like all of these things. And I think this is the year that we can put a whole lot of resources into it. So for me, it's it's as much about that as it is about anything else. And having you know, run one of these programs, right? Like not like done the funding for a community playground. Like I, I did that, you know, with a partner and we raised a lot of money and we were able to do it. It was a whole lot more work than crowdfunding, right? Like that whole lot more work. But it's doable. So, depends on where you are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Depends. That's entirely where you're on from. Yep. I mean, I wrote for They've never been able to raise $60,000 in, you know, 30 days to fund and get it in place. So, we, it took us take, way more than it take us 10 It would take us 10 years to do something like that. Yeah. Um, and, and I understand the budget pressures. But we are the Economic Development and Commerce Committee. And we make recommendations. We don't make the final decision on what get what's get what gets funded and what doesn't. I think we can make recommendations to the Appropriations Committee. And we can rate them at high, medium, low, and they will look at the waterfalls that we put in front of them. And if there is extra money, there might not be any extra money. So every one of the things that we put in here are gonna get wiped out. But if, if we don't, I think we need to stand up for what this committee is for. And then this happens, but um, otherwise, we might just well send a letter down to them saying, you know, go with the governor's recommend and, um, you know, we don't recommend anything. So, when I'm looking at our list, and, and I do think that we are, you know, trying our best with our mission as a, as a yeah. committee, right? I also see up there, and you probably know I come from like an economic justice kind of orientation, want to make sure that, that the people and people's basic needs are thought of in terms of the workforce and professionals. And we have professionals of color in there. We have, um, we haven't talked about it yet, but um, helping young folks stay and be, uh, and find, make their roots deeper in Vermont with the, uh, the Vermont Jobs Retention Program. We have refugees, transitional housing issues. To me, some of these basic fundamental needs are really making sure that we're, people are able to make Vermont their community and afford to stay here and get jobs that are um, lifting their economic security. Those are the kinds of things I start to look at first in a tighter budget season than these additional ones, which also build community for sure. And I, I wanna make sure we have community here to enjoy these spaces first and then start really building up on the community uh, development side of it second. I, I mean, I see it as at least as important as Vermont Council on the Arts, the Vermont Sympathy Orchestra, Vermont Historical Society, and the Vermont Humanities Council. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we we happily went along their asks and even more. Uh, whereas whereas I, I know like my community, no benefit from the PSL. So well, no, just that goes for me too. <laughs> you, know, um, you know, virtually none of those actually impact my communities. And so yet we, we recognize these have contribution to Vermont culture and therefore encourages people to move, encourages people to be involved in our communities. And so we see the value in that. And uh, so I feel like <clears throat> those don't actually, none of those actually encourage our community members to come together, work together on a project and build, build cohesion. They're just things that make community nice. So I say, I, I put this as a higher priority than those. I would maybe add, so I feel like um, <clears throat> when it comes to Arts Council communities, I fully, <laughs> fully support us there. Um, 
like I, I guess like I, in conversations with my communities, trying to work through things like mural projects or farmers market support, or like it is often not one or the other. It is like Arts sure. Council and Better Places trying to like figure out as an ecosystem the best funding, the best opportunities, what nonprofits are involved, whether or not people can match the stipulations of an Arts Council grant, or if Better Places helps fill, fill that gap as they like get off their feet. Um, so like, I think it's a, and proposition, but for, for me, I like, yeah, so I don't, I can't even think of a time that's been on my radar in our region. Um, and so, yeah, there are certain things that like fully support creative economy and humanitarian <laughs> and, uh, things, but, but I, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to make a decision there because, um, community development feels just as equally important to me as economic development especially coming out of COVID with uh, just I don't think isolation. Should, I, and my point wasn't we should oh, yeah, choose totally. one or yeah. the other. My point is to go back to what Mike was saying. Our job is to is to make recommendations for things that we think are beneficial to yeah. workforce development, economic development. And we saw that those had a value. This also, I feel like, should be on that menu of options that ultimately appropriations is going to decide. Um, I would like to concur with Kirk in regards to especially Vermont Symphony or Orchestra um, Arts Council. I think one of the things with this, this, this budget we definitely have to keep in mind it's like with any other budget needs versus wants and they're nice but in regards to if it came down between that and community development, community development in itself is a form of economic development, I would say, is at that point in time, you're preserving communities long-term, you're having businesses stay open long-term. Uh, if communities can't work towards increasing their own development, if you can't build playgrounds, if you can't build projects that help those communities, and those, those projects also, they're generally constructive. They have local businesses that work on them. They help fund the local economy in that aspect. And not saying that the other ones don't, but as other members of our council have expressed, I can't remember the last time I had the Vermont Sympathy Orchestra come through my town. I mean, it may have, and I may have not noticed it, but it's, it's one of those things that seems more of a want at that point, as opposed to a need, where making sure our communities have the ability to invest in themselves is a higher priority. Talk to me about the community development block grants that are in here for ten and a half million dollars, eleven. So CDBG, yes, yeah, federal funds. Yeah. So, so it's mean, it's federal funds that can be used for stuff, something like this that can't be used for something. The municipality like this. has to apply. Yeah. So this all has to go through the municipality, and then it can be sub grant. There's very strict federal guidelines. I just went through that myself when I don't have it. <clears throat> um, yeah. It's a big lift. Yep. And this is the local match that's in our budget, or this is because no. there's we have to, governors recommend this. Yeah, the money flows into the state, and then um, housing and community development has a board that oversees it. They, I think they meet four times a year, mm -hmm. and so municipalities have to apply uh, with a plan with. So there's planning grants, and then there's regular grants. Yeah. They're generally housing type things that happen with rural edge with us. They'll they'll apply for those, and they can become revolving loan funds. But it's really not a space for that. And then the downtown grants. Those the are the tax credits. Downtown tax credit. It says just downtown grants under the. 802 subgrants. It's half a million, 550. Yeah, I mean, again, that's you know, just another thing I saw in the grants out inventory. Um, I don't know exactly where it is. I know that, you know, it's 40% higher than it was last year. I know that it's a special fund. So I don't know the source of the special fund. I just know that it's, you know, not, not GF dollars, not federal, federal dollars. Well, not direct federal dollars. The special fund. Um, 
you know, sometimes it's not always clear exactly what a special fund is, yeah. what its source is. Sometimes it's an interagency transfer. Or sometimes it's like a federal dollars with a match. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to to or so, picture yeah, this and understand like where this falls and you know, I mean, yeah. Those are all yeah. So I mean, Sorry, those Jim. all all of those go to like economic community development. But the better place is one like one of the reasons that I and support of it is because it literally is the only one that doesn't take like municipality like a lot of a big lift like yeah um yeah like the downtown money is usually restricted only to like sprinkler systems and alarm systems and electric improvements like i've, done, like I've gotten all of these so, yeah. my nonprofit stuff yeah <laughs> only that have certain requirements met Right, in only certain districts. Yeah. Um, yeah. Downtown tax credits are not applied for by the municipality. Right. You have to be a designated downtown or designated village center in order for and we a, bis a business to be able to apply for those downtown tax credits. Yeah. yeah. At some point, so I'll be in my. We'll brain. get more. <laughs> We're going to hear from me. I'm a PDF of all the funds that you have from TAC. <laughs> We'll be hearing tomorrow more on the maybe more. See what it's like. Tomorrow at one fifteen. Oh, well, at one we'll be looking at the outdoor recreation economy piece that's in six seventy three that we heard from yesterday from Representative Rice and then um, six eighty seven. Uh, which is the Act 250 bill, but within that is the downtown tax credits. The, there's some proposals in there that we want to weigh in on. But, um, so we'll hear more about that. We'll maybe get a better flavor of downtown tax credit program as well. Um, all right, let's just leave this for now. And let's stew on it a little bit. Like the rat tether step. UBM. Um, so that's the Remount Jobs Retention Program. Um, not sure what other skill. I'm not sure if they're upskill or not. Is that in the governor's recommend? Uh, no, it's under visa, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, one D101. Um, so UVM, we had UVM had an upskill that we provided in 2021, 22. Oh, that's a reversion. Sorry. Yeah. That, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So that that timed out, so that's yeah. why it was reverted. Yep. Did they not call it out? I don't. No, I don't think so. I don't think there's. And I don't think we had a request. But the Green Mountain job retention. So the money that's still in that fund is actually there to fund the students that are signed up for it currently to pay for the following year uh, $2,500 payment if they stay in Vermont, right? Yeah. So I don't think there's really new money for that. And I think yeah, that's, I think where, that's what we are. where we need to recommend yeah, I've gotten up. They did. They did. UVM was asking us for 1.5 million for workforce upskill, which is not in the governor's budget. Okay. Anywhere. And they're asking for 1.25 in the Green Mountain Jobs and Retention, which also is not in the governor's budget. For me, the Green Mountain Jobs Retention is highest priority. 
Yeah. Well, I think we won't put that down right well, now. Well, for my notes, but yeah, the, the, um, if you guys remember it. Yeah. yeah, we'll do that when we come get to it. Um, so, so workforce upskill, I think has been has been successful. Um, I forgot to add that to our spreadsheet. But they did. That wasn't nice. You talked about changing their um, um, what do you call it? feedback form posts, right? To find out if people are actually in better jobs and making more money yeah. and all of those things. Right. But we don't really have that information yet. But... but there were a lot of people that took advantage of of the upskilling program at UVM. Which I think is is also can help set up UVM to do not just look at you know four year degrees, but how else can they help in training the workforce. Is there, is there a but after that? Were you about to say a but? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. So, a second. Exclamation point. I'm more of a comma, but kind of person. <laughs> well, I'll just, if I may, okay. and I'm sorry to miss what you just all just said, but um, on the upskill program, this is the that uh, this is the program where people are getting coursework covered, 100% covered um, at UVM, but their employers are not necessarily providing any contribution towards the payments, right? Okay. I mean, that's my butt. My butt is, this is, um, well, this is helpful. Um, there is no requirement that people stay in the state uh, after going through a publicly funded um, two courses at UVM, I think that it's important for the employers to step in and start to help to uh, pay for that cost, especially because they're the ones ultimately benefiting from this. And unlike some of these other programs where we have the Green Mountain Jobs Retention Program, for example, there's a requirement to stay in the state. I just feel like this program, because of, again, budget constraints, and I think in general, needs to have a little bit more of a, of a Public private partnership, if it is going to continue with state money um, to make it a little a bit more sustainable. That was my book. Sorry if I'm repeating something. something. No, we okay. don't see that. Okay. You just put the name up there, and I was looking for. I'm just waiting for me. Okay, thanks. Looking for background. Uh, how many people were, were served, and what other data we had on it, and I'm struggling. Mm -hmm. Finding it on our and we look, look, see if there's anything under winding filming. I will add that I am. I think it's all sorted out, and we've, um, you know, it's fine now. But uh, it is somewhat alarming to me that there was maybe money appropriated to this program that. Just kind of got lost and they didn't know you know and there was maybe some overlap with whether or not you know we had set a deadline and they weren't able to spend our dollars after a certain point but it sounds like the money kind of sat in an account for like a year or two um before now you know it's being reverted in this budget or in the paa um and so just you know that idea of just having you know money that we tried to, to spend Within, within this program and the, the jobs and retention program feels a little to me like, you know, I just want to check the administration of these funds a little bit and make sure that we know, you know, how the funds are going out or not. The other thing about this program, I'm just looking back at my notes. I also don't see the number of people served in this, in my notes usually take 
some note of that if they say it, but um, as you might, you might recall, over the three years that this program has run, they asked for income, then they didn't ask for income um, in terms of their applications of people going into the program in year three, they asked for that information but did not require it. So it's, it isn't, but even the folks um, coming into the program, there's not that income um, eligibility component in how people are utilizing this program. So again, in terms of sustainability and making sure this program is being, that we are, sub, in my mind, um, it's important to subsidize folks who don't have the income otherwise to be able to access these programs. And I think more guard, guardrails, whatever the right term is around this program are gonna be important for this to become a sustainable program if, it, if the state needs to fund it. And that's employers part, portion of it, but it's also that income Acknowledging the income that people have who are who are utilizing the program, because we're using we're having the same conversation with other CCD related programs around income eligibility, and it feels awkward, strange that this doesn't have a similar framework built around it. First part of the sentence is feeling maybe not as uh, accurate based on what I'm hearing, but well, I would all say, of the committee. I would say that upskill program um, was successful in the time, right? Like for a COVID program to make sure that people's skill work or skills were kept up to date or improved or right at a time where people were forced to um, forced into a holding pattern. I think that. It, it was successful then, but I, yeah, I agree hundred percent. Like how do we, and I think that I'm gonna hold there. Just gonna say that. Presentation, <laughs> um, I don't wanna hear it, but uh, presentation for this, just if you're trying to find it, it's under February 15th, under Maureen yeah, Heber, Heber. It does get into headcount and enrollments, typos. Some lack of data for last year. Better data you know, from 2021 to 22. Yeah, 23 is not available yet. Yeah, they have some enrollment data. They can, I don't know the difference between headcount and enrollment, I guess. Oh, headcount, I assume, is actual attendance. Enrollment is people that originally signed up. There's big disparities there, though. I think they said that they don't pay until they've done a week, right? A week in the program. So some people enroll, but then don't follow through, and they're not going to, they don't pay, start paying for the course until they have a, a week of attendance or something. Am I making that up? Maybe that's different. No, no, you're, I remember that, yeah. yeah. In hindsight, now it feels weird that there, there's such a big gap between enrollments and headcount, though. Yeah. Say for this one. To capture what I want to say, but that's just me. <laughs> so you all don't have to say that as well. This would be, I would actually not either fund this or keep it a low priority um, unless there were these other provisions to capture it. I'm not sure UVM. Um, they well, the other maybe. case program is the one that they partner with businesses and have business income, and the upskill program is the one that the state pays for. Mm -hmm. They do similar things, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. Not the same. I mean, paces, I think, more designed specifically with a business, I think. But um, this rolls through pace, I think, right? They're sort of, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I, I'm now, sorry, y'all, tired brain today for me. Um, but the other program that's run through the state that we had uh, more recent testimony on. 
where the state actually goes in and partners with upskilling within an employer. They got new, um, I don't know, a new Vermont machine. Yeah, the Vermont training, training program. Um, I see similarities here, uh, yeah. and it's just it makes me curious around um, training program is generally manufacturing. Right. Okay. So, it's, but it's not limited to though technically the Vermont training program, or is it always been limited to manufacturing? It's not limited, but it's traditionally been that. Yeah. Okay. And this is sort of more of a color, yeah. but but different. Yeah. Sector, but it's a different way of delivery, and it'd be it's just interesting to side by side comparing those two. There's an aspect here where I feel like we're, I mean, they talk a lot about scholarship recipients represented over 300 companies, but some of the top ones were UVM and UVM Medical Center, Central Vermont Medical Center, Howard Center. And so I feel like we have a lot of programs that also target those populations. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if some of those programs that do have some of those financial administrative mm -hmm. thresholds are kind of targeting some of these, you know, higher need populations already. And this is well, I think weren't they talking about that wherever possible they're blending other other scholarships in with it so that it, yeah, it, it extends the, the money that they get out, like the advancement grants maybe part of that at that these add. Yeah. With it or two opportunity. Mm -hmm. Are they though? Because they're asking for income. I mean, some of the years, but then I just felt like this was just a 100% paid for first come first serves structure without any other additional financial. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the beauty of this program is that the individual gets to choose where they see their need being into in improving their skill, mm -hmm. right? And I think that we have targeted programs for the skills that we want more of in Vermont that are different from this, right? So we're looking at like two different things, right? Like are we targeting certain fields like teaching and nursing and you know some of the others that we know we have that we have needs for in the state. Like originally that's what we set it up for. I was here then. <laughs> I don't have I don't have the memory log on that one. Yeah it's a lot it does say less than three times the federal property. Oh, that says only 18%. So do you have to fall into one of the few categories, maybe? Are you looking at the presentation from Yeah, it's okay. slide five on under Maureen. Yeah, the eligibility. You got to be one of the unemployed those or underemployed. You said the 15. Seeking economic advancement and then less than three yeah. times federal poverty level. It's only 18%. 18%. 18%. So you only have to be one or well, that's less than the poverty level. So it's telling me that the majority of people that are accessing are above. No, right. right. Above the three times. Yeah. But, yeah. Sorry, what's that? Which number slide? No, it's five. five. Thank you. This isn't a high priority. I think it's, I think it's great to have opportunities for people to better their skills. And in a year where we're looking at budget tightness, I have other higher priorities in education. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we keep coming back to this and not, not trying to do too much weighing and, you know, is this a good program or not versus one versus the other. But, and, you know, I do, and that's kind of the same vein, I, I'm putting this lower on my list than. Green Mountain Jobs and Retention right. and, um, and 802. Uh, not 802 because 802 is in the budget. And we're not going to even address it right. because it's getting its funding. Right. Um, but tuition advantage. I feel like tuition advantage has, to me, is serving a similar need, but maybe more focused on. You know, an underserved population. Yeah. You know, as far as the reporting, I think we got reporting on that. Well, 
pretty wrong too. Started QUI. <laughs> Sweet. Um, yeah, and you know, I feel like my thoughts are like in the last five budget year, I do, you know, this, this program has a lot of value, but well, I think recognizing other pressures, there are other programs that serve similar populations with higher need. The other piece for me is I mean, we keep hearing that employers are removing their requirements for their job requirements, right? You don't have to have a master's degree, you don't have to have certain credentials, right. we'll train you, we'll train you, we'll train you. So where's, I think the value is less than it was. So maybe what we say is that we recognize that the workforce upskill program has value. We would uh, we would like to see employer participation in the program. That's all we say. And then, Employer contribution. Yeah. 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 Because yeah, 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 they are yeah, yeah, participating. Right. Like, yeah. Having letting their the board. Is that existing now? No, I don't think so. Maybe to support the future of the program or to. Want to actually extend the amount of dollars yeah. that yeah that are helping people so contribution. Extend the reach. It's Rico. Yeah, no, I'm just thinking like you have to extend the reach of any any support or any dollars. Um, any um, eligibility requirements? There are, I think they already have that. I thought they just started track. They said it says eligibility, but I thought they just started. I don't remember exactly. I would say last year. They, they had to have income level and other uh, yeah. requirements eligibility. The first two years, there was no income eligibility. Yeah. Year one was COVID, yeah. many Vermont are year two new requirements based on federal poverty level criteria and some additional rules. Year three, they asked for the income, but they did not require it. And then the federal government changed the rules for year three and allowed anyone can be, be in the program. So that's sort of So in continued income we eligibility. The funds that we use must be. They were worried about federal mm -hmm. regulation. So does it make sense to end continued eligibility requirements or do you want to leave that off? I think we can leave it off. I think they already have some requirements. I don't think they have requirements. They're asking for information. So year three, they ask for income level, but they don't require it. So if they're not even required, they're not, they're not they're applying not, it for they who just gets want to track it. I it's think, not a requirement to get into Right, because everyone, it was a first come, first serve piece. Everyone who applies gets it covered. Yeah, so 75% of the folks who took the programs had good jobs and were not underemployed, and 82% were at more than three times the federal poverty.
That's not helping the population that we're trying to help. They're asking for, I know they're not required, they're asking for income. They're uh, getting levels the data. just to yeah, have yeah. who's in the program, but it's not used to decide who gets the money because everybody gets the money no matter if you make $100,000 or $20,000. Maybe what we need to say is that, so we would like to continue to discuss ways to improve we should improve the program to make sure the program's i think going to folks with the most economic need or income based well, to the sure employees. is that we're helping the unemployed and underemployed right. yeah um yeah. I also think that there is a, there is an income element to it because someone could be between yeah. pretty high paying jobs yeah, and yeah. be unemployed technically by choice or underemployed because they have like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar paying job yeah. they're making money. Yeah. Have we talked about the categories of the most popular courses? The course curriculum that's provided. I, I struggle with some of the like digital marketing fundamentals, school library media. These these are not, some of these are not highly in demand jobs. They're very competitive spaces. And I worry that it's a minimal benefit to someone who's seeking to to ensure that lower low income Unemployed and underemployed. Are able to take it, able to access and benefit from. Um, pro, yeah, from um, what are they getting? A, are they getting a credential? Or are they getting Education, credits? Credit. Oh, yeah. No, some are benefit. not credit and some are credit. Oh. Benefit. Quality of life. Well, I think we want to talk about high demand jobs, right? Yeah. Um, so the, the, the unemployed are able to access and benefit benefits from the program in in high demand access the program and benefit from higher paying jobs or well, from high demand jobs from high demand jobs in Vermont. High demand, or not high demand? What What do we? Uh, me high value and high value. Not value. Yeah. What are the What are the job categories we need to fill in the state? Right. Yeah. I. I'm oh, there, I mean, there could be jobs. I think high demand. Um, well, it depends on which side you're looking at. What's high demand? Yeah. It's. It's all question. Yeah. But it's <laughs> yeah, high demand. What's the we need? I mean, what Vermont needs, we need nurses, we need educators, we need electricians and plumbers and HVAC people. And that, I think that's what we're talking about. We need people that can splice yeah. um, fiber. We need, you know, alignment. We need essential, critically valued critically lawyers. Valued. 
<laughs> More lawyers. It's always the answer. Access to program. Appreciate your feedback. More than that, we're going a little crazy. I'm really comfortable with this. Access to program and learn the skills necessary for essential employment. Essential employment in Vermont. Yeah. Say that one more time. Access the program and earn and gain and maybe gain the skills necessary to fill. You just I don't know if it's high. I mean, it is critical occupations. It's high de high demand might be yeah, critical occupation. Or critical, not critical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, set in sections. 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 Yeah, yeah, I think that says it. Okay. Um, that strengthening communities in downtown program is environment and energy. That's it is in, is it in like the. Oh, I will. Do the energy energy standard that's the first piece of information that I got. So I'll do more Thanks. Yep. Yeah, so some of that overlap. I think, you know, like I'd put this together maybe a, a day or two late of. Mm -hmm. You know, getting certain people in here at the wrong time. Obviously, we weren't able to get testimony from the AHS. Um, so that's where I feel like there's maybe some gaps. I don't beat yourself up. Yeah, it's 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 no, 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 I don't mean that. Yeah. Saying that just also in like when we were able to get people in here, sometimes yeah. it's not work. Yeah. And the spreadsheet has been the it's most important. helpful in the four years I've been here. The spreadsheet is dynamic and actually all of us can access. It's very helpful. Ready for the next one? Yeah. No, yeah, sir. Um, we all have somewhere to be at 12, so I'm just going to Yeah, Green Mountain Jobs Retention Program. So, sorry, uh, do, you, or do you support the request? It's not really addressed here. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate may not be a high priority, but you probably still want to say, you know, what your ultimate decision is, right? I imagine when we come back through and do the priority ranking, this is going to be low. Um, yeah. And I'll leave it there. I think, I think that will speak to it for itself. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe we could just leave it like that. Except, you know, I don't want to say that we don't support the request, mm -hmm. but I think that kind of spells out why they're maybe not more of a full throated. Right. We support the request. So maybe you just have ambivalent. It can't kind of come to the so I, I'm doing house education at 1130. I can probably push that a little bit, but just so All right. we can do maybe another 10 minutes. And I think I'm back here, right, Andrew, this afternoon to finish up, but. Um, yeah. I think the next yeah, I think this is a great program. I think I really like the fact that it's open to all college graduates in Vermont. Um, and the, I mean, they just, it was, it was um, well used and appreciated um, how uh, it's been adapting based on that, how it's been rolling out. Um, so I'm I'm in support of this. I think it's a good a good and much more logical investment in folks staying in Vermont than anything. I need some additional programs that we have attempted as a state that this committee that wasn't necessarily super keen on, but I think this one is actually one that I think is going to have um, some long standing positive impact for us gaining, especially younger folks, to stay in the state and helping the monitors. Does it require it can't require it to stay in the state, it but does. in order it does. It does. in order to get the money. Yeah. 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 We're not we're not we're not yeah. handcuffing them, but yes. 
Yeah. That's where my head goes, all right? Like, you <laughs> can't be literal, right? Uh, <laughs> in Vermont for two years. Oh. Full-time jobs in there. Um, I think we can say participation continues to grow. The average age is 24.59 years old. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. I don't know why I wrote that in. <laughs> Average age is 24.51. So that's one gets one for me. And has some business match? Yeah, we want, yeah, well, I, think, I think we can say, and businesses are beginning to um, provide matches. Provide matches and use this as a recruitment tool. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They've added um, master's degrees and, and considering adding Vermont Law School. There's your nod to lawyers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so, well, listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> you, if you graduated from Vermont Law School, you could have, if you were staying here in the state for two years, um, be eligible. Be eligible for some loan forgiveness. Too late. Yep. Graduated way too early. Yeah. Way too early. <laughs> way too early. I should have waited 20 years. <laughs> so it's it's post-college graduation with bachelor's, master's. You don't have to put it in there. Just, yeah. 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 We haven't even talked about the next one yet. They just they testified we haven't even talked about it. Oh, we know. We now know. I I have a double check, but I it's hard to read the, the, the BAA pieces that were sent to us, not understanding the showing how Senate, where, but where did, what did they settle on? I, I know the Senate didn't want the 671,000 in. The House did, but what did they settle on? I'm not mm -hmm. documenting that, or I'm not understanding it. But anyway, um, you got to go, Rick. You want to do the humanitarian? No, that's going to take yeah, discussion. Okay. We, we got to figure, we got to find out what is in the BAA. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because there were supposed to be 671 there, but if they took it out, then they're asking us for almost 998. Yeah. Do you know what category? What the is letters? It? Okay. Because I didn't look at the document itself. I'm looking at the, the BAA document I'm looking at. What Diane sent us yesterday. So, so, so they did it, they did fund it. Also, press. What are the what's the letter in the chat? Also, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Hey, you're welcome. Have yeah. fun downstairs. It's a much bigger room. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Uh, it used to be our coat room. That's true. Did, how did they get that room? How did Gov Ops and Education okay. get this? COVID. <laughs> yeah, but why, but why that? They were one of the really more time. people want to be able to They generally have bigger crowds. Okay. Yeah. Education used to be over here. Ways and Means was over there. Institutions and Corrections was over here. Ag was the further down. I think that's where they are now. Up there, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, let's just see what we can find for uh, make sure that we understand what happened with the Transitional housing. Is there a side by side document in what was sent on appropriations to all of us? At the BAA? No, I didn't. This list. So there's a tracking sheet, but that just seems like. Yeah, but it's not telling you anything. Yeah. I would, everything that's in there, I'm not seeing anything. Yeah.
Is, is, is it in the BAA? Is that in the calendar? No, it's not because I haven't been called up yet. It may get called no. up today. Some notice of it, is it? It would, yes, it's on notice today, so it should be. Well, they don't put it in there because it's too long. It's just no time to usually to the journal. Yeah. Even though the budget too is short. Yeah. Did that go to everybody? I sent you. That's a sound and sound guy, good idea. Well, it is in the budget, or it's in the <laughs> Is it in our calendar today? Mm -hmm. No, I mean the section. Um, the section number or the budget number. What page is it on? The, on the calendar, it's on page 716 at the very bottom. Our calendar or? The house calendar for the day. Yeah. I guess for uh, the document. Yeah. It's the Okay, so we so I did so yeah, about six hundred twelve thirty. Got it. Okay. Okay, that answers that. So. Know, the letter will focus a lot more on that. Yeah, not need not other whatever it is, three hundred. You know, additional three hundred something like that. Twenty six, three twenty seven. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think we can go off live. We're back here at one o'clock. Discussions.